Spinal anesthetics are a wonderful thing, and the list of benefits that spinals confer over general anesthesia continues to grow. However, a single injection spinal does have some downsides in certain situations. In this video, we'll outline the rationale for the use of continuous spinal anesthesia and describe the technique that we use to make it a safe, effective anesthetic option. We'll frequently care for patients with valvular problems or pulmonary hypertension or severe cardiac pump failure, and we're faced with the dual goals of one, avoiding general anesthesia and the trespass on the cardiopulmonary system, and two, minimizing or avoiding any sympathectomy associated with neuraxial anesthesia that might provoke hypotension. Now, I love spinals, and many times in these circumstances, it's appropriate to do a single injection spinal. However, you have to get your dose just right. Too little, and you may run out of spinal time, meaning you now have to execute a far inferior plan B in a vulnerable patient in the middle of the case. Ugh, nightmare. Too much dose, and you incur the very things you wish to avoid. A drop in RV preload, falling cardiac output, profound arterial hypotension, etc. The patient response to subarachnoid local anesthetic is variable, and patients just can't tell us what dose is ideal for them. A continuous spinal technique solves both of those problems. A catheter can be placed in the subarachnoid space and spinal anesthesia gradually and incrementally established so as to find that perfect level. Here's our technique, followed by some tips and tricks. We use a regular epidural kit with an 18-gauge TUI needle and a 19-gauge multi-orifice catheter. In the pre-op block area, the patient can be positioned either sitting or lateral. We're frequently doing these in patients with hip fracture, and lateral is more comfortable. After local skin infiltration, the TUI needle is advanced toward the subarachnoid space using whatever approach you favor. I'm a fan of paramedian, especially in those elderly trauma patients who can't flex their lumbar spines well in the lateral position. Check frequently for CSF to appear. There's no need to attach a loss resistant syringe. We're going to be passing right through the epidural space. You may feel a pop or give as you pass through the ligamentum flavum and dura, but not always. Once you do get in the subarachnoid space, you'll know it. In patients with normal CSF pressure, the flow is not subtle, even in the lateral position. Do your best to stem the flow of CSF with your thumb over the hub while you prepare your catheter. You're going to lose some CSF, and that's not a big deal. Just don't leave the tap running while you do the next step. Advance the catheter and remove the needle. The goal is to have about 3 to 4 centimeters in the subarachnoid space. Then secure it to the patient's back. Now is when we start to dose the local anesthetic. We'll usually start with 5 milligrams of isobaric bupivacaine. We'll then roll the patient back to the operating room, and by the time we're positioned on the table, we can assess the hemodynamic effect and presence of a sensory and motor block. If needed, we can dose another 2.5 milligrams at a time as necessary until we get the desired level. Once we're cruising at steady state, we're usually giving 2.5 milligrams every 45 to 60 minutes to maintain the spinal block where we want it. Now you might be thinking, what about postural puncture headache? Well, it just doesn't appear to be a thing, at least in this population. For a 22-year-old, yeah, that patient's high risk. The 82-year-old with aortic stenosis and a fragility fracture, not so much. We've been doing this technique for over a decade and we just have not had a signal, which is great. You may also question, why not an epidural? Well, two reasons. One, you need way more local anesthetic to get surgical anesthesia using an epidural than a spinal. Lots of local in a 45 kilo lady means increased toxicity risk. Also, epidurals can be patchy. If you need your neuraxial to be perfect, and that's why we're doing this, right? You want spinal anesthesia, not an epidural. Here are some tips and tricks for continuous spinal. First, be gentle when advancing the catheter. That catheter tip is poking up against some sensitive structures, including the conus medullaris. Slow advancement is key to avoiding paresthesias. Don't tickle the conus. Nobody likes that. Use gravity to confirm that you've got a continuous column of fluid. Maintaining sterile technique, hold the end of the catheter below the level of the insertion site. If it drips passively, no need to aspirate. You're in the right spot. We only use isobaric medications with this technique. You don't want a hyperbaric solution to sink down to the lowest point of the spinal column, i.e. T6. That's just going to get you the very hypotension you want to avoid. And finally, and I can't stress this enough, make sure everyone who is involved in the care of that patient knows it's a spinal catheter, not an epidural. We use bright stickers and careful specific handoff to other team members. As a rule, these get removed from the patient at the end of the case before leaving the operating room. Continuous spinal allows for unlimited duration of a safe, titratable spinal block with limited exposure to local anesthetic. It's a great technique that allows you to care for very sick patients in an elegant and simple way.